Hey everyone, um, my name is Laura. Welcome to our screencast today on Webpack, um, a hard source plugin that my colleague Z Goddard um, has helped create. Um, I want to say thanks so much for coming and um, we're really excited to get started. So I'm going to introduce um, my colleague, uh, Matt Saravian, the director of web apps, to take it away. All right, you can ask questions um, in chat, and I believe Matt has also posted a poll, but he'll go over that. Thanks so much. Hi. I think everyone can hear me. Um, as Laura mentioned, uh, I'm Matt Sarabian. I'm the director of web applications at Boku. My colleague Z Goddard here is, is as well. And we just want to kind of talk today about Webpack and the hard source plugin and how you can improve your build time. So for about five to 10 minutes, I'll show you how it's integrated into a project. We can talk about um, a few gotchas uh, when it comes to adopting it. And then the rest of our time together, we really want to leave open to y'all to ask questions so we can help you use this stuff. Um, so yeah, there's to that end on the right hand side of your screen, there's a polls tab. And there's three questions there um, that kind of will help us get to know how familiar you are with Webpack and hard source today. That'll help guide our content. So if you could take a second and answer those questions, that would be great. Um, there's also a questions tab. And even if you don't have a question uh, to ask, please keep monitoring that tab. And the reason is because you'll be able to see everybody else's questions and upvote them and downvote them. And that'll help us prioritize them um, depending on how many we get. So yeah, I'll just get started too by saying we're going to be recording this. And so if you want to come back and watch replays, you'll be able to do that. And if you haven't registered ahead of time, we'll put the video up on YouTube and, and write a blog post about it too. So you can definitely share that with folks that you think might be interested. So to start, I think what I'm going to do is share my screen and hopefully you'll be able to see what is on it. Cool. Yeah, at a high level, um, it looks like pretty much everybody knows what Webpack is based on the poll. Um, but I'll just give a brief overview for anybody that might be watching this that isn't quite sure. Webpack's a front-end build tool, and it's dedicated to kind of answering the question, why should our build tooling only be bundling JavaScript files? So we want to be able to write code that actually catalogs all of our modules dependencies. So you can actually write something like, uh, this, for example, require theme.style or require image.assetpng. And that's really powerful, not just because we can have Webpack take over where, say, something like Gulp or Grunt would need to do CSS pre-processing or anything like that, um, but also because Webpack gives us all the tools that we need to assess our bundle and chunk it out such that the user is only required to download and consume exactly what they need to do what they're trying to do in your application. Even though most projects don't necessarily get all the way um, into Webpack code splitting, that's really its promise, the, the improved analyzation and support of that critical path. Um, you know, think about if you're writing a game and it has 20 levels, you don't want somebody who's just coming to your game for the first time playing level one to need to wait to download all the assets for levels two through 20. Um, or if you have a large application with many views, you can deliver those views and the code that implements them on demand as the user accesses those parts of your application. The trouble is that as we ask Webpack to go beyond the land of say, concatenation and minification, things that require JS and Browserify used to do for us. Um, I mean, at least for me, you know, before I started using Webpack, that's what I was using. Um, yeah, Webpack can do all those things and any other kinds of like Asians that you need, transpilation, whatever it is, but the more you ask it to do, the longer it needs to do those things. And if we were only cutting builds once a day or something like that to ship to production, maybe that wouldn't matter. Um, but now we're writing code like this. And this code isn't strictly valid without Webpack, right? What does it mean to require theme.stylus? Um, you know, we need Webpack to actually do active development. And that can mean that we have to wait around a lot. And Webpack, um, has this multi-stage build process. And so what my colleague Z's plugin does is use the hooks that Webpack gives us to dive in and cache those intermediate stages of a module so that Webpack doesn't have to say, go all the way out to a file system to resolve it, do all of its processing on it, 
This is great, especially for like a third party dependency that hasn't changed since you brought it into your application. Um, or if you have a particularly large app and you're making some small change, adding a comma, inserting a semicolon, you don't want to have to be sitting around waiting for every single third party dependency to get rebundled every single time you make a change. And Z and I can answer more technical questions about exactly how this works. I have the plugin code here, uh, but I don't know exactly how much y'all want to get into that, but we can definitely do that later. So please ask those questions if you're curious how that works under the hood. Mostly what I want to show is how Webpack can get brought into a project. So this here, we'll just take this part away for now. We'll remove the cache. This is my duck hunt game. Oops. Pretty simple. Replication of the NES game. Used to be using Browser of Hive, and now it's using Webpack. Um, and I have a big third-party dependency, and that's the Pixie JS rendering engine that handles putting this in Canvas or WebGL, depending on the consumer. And so I changed it over to use Webpack instead. The Webpack config itself is relatively small. Oh, I'm already running that over there. My Webpack config itself is relatively small. I want to be able to uh, you know, transpile my ES2015 code into ES5, so I have Babel Loader in here. Um, right now, I'm not actually using it to load my PNGs, uh, but I want to be doing that. I'm you know, using it to load some JSON data as well, and I'm not yet using it for the audio files, but I want to be doing that too. Still, my build uh, kind of takes a while. Considering it's such a small project, usually my build is about five seconds. And let's see how long we get for this run. Ooh, this one's even longer. Maybe because I'm screen screen sharing. So that was 12 seconds. Um, kind of kind of rough, especially considering I'm not even doing anything with images or MP3s. If I put back in uh, the hard source plugin. Now I'm kind of cheating because I already have an established cache directory here because I've been using hard source on this project. This will go through and this will use that cache. So it'll still, still take a little time, but you can see that's significantly less, right? That's, that's a little less than half the time. This one only took five seconds. Now, if I were to change something in my code, let's say I were to add a new state. It's going to rebuild that file because it's changed, but it's going to use the cached versions of everything else. It's not going to blow away my entire Webpack cache that it's using. So you can see that module that it just ended up rebuilding. It was just this one that it's changed since the last time it populated the cache. And it added a little bit of time, but it's still not 12 seconds, right? Um, it's, it's significantly less than that. And so this is the most simple config that I've found to use with hard source. It needs a cache directory, and that's just essentially where it should store um, its cache data. So here's what that looks like. Uh, it can be anywhere. I like to put it in node modules dot cache um, slash hard source, but th this is this is user defined. It should be absolute. It will accept a relative path, but more and more things in Webpack really want that absolute path config. So it's a good idea to use path dot join here. Records path is something that may already be set depending on your project. What this does is this lets Webpack keep the same IDs and and store in a persistent way the ID of your um, applications modules with the ID that Webpack gives it. The config hash method here is what determines what these folders are named. So this is just actually running an object hash on my Webpack config, which is a JavaScript object. And so that's going to make sure that, let's say I have multiple um, Webpack configs, or I change this to add a different loader, that's going to make sure that a new cache is created. And this kind of brings up one of the gotchas uh, with this plugin. And that's that by default, it really doesn't know where to put 
your stuff. If I didn't have this here, it would store everything inside this, this directory, but it wouldn't know when to bust, when to you know, make a new cache. So giving it some knowledge about that, and that's what this is, it's gonna help distinguish these things. The other thing that it has under the hood is a concept of your environment. And this is what the default environment hash looks like. And this is, you know, basically takes your root directory, watches node modules, and watches your package.json. So what we're trying to do by default is support the NPM ecosystem. So if you add a new node module, we're assuming that there's gonna be big changes that we need to make a new cache for. If you're, you know, updating an existing thing in node modules or you're, you're upgrading a version, not just adding a new package, we wanna be able to bust your cache for that too. You'll notice though, this isn't purging anything. And that's one of the things that you should keep in mind is that if you have a really large project with really large build artifacts, these cache directories can build up on your machine and take up space. So it's a good idea to go through and clean them out. There's an open issue right now where we wanna look at, you know, trying to figure out a property that might be able to help with that logic so that we could do some purging, but it's a little bit complicated because we obviously don't want to um, purge things that, that the user might need. So right now, that's a task that's left to, to um, the folks who adopt this plugin to kind of stay on top of. The other thing that uh, you should be aware of when using the Webpack hard source plugin is that it doesn't always play well with other plugins. Um, it seems to work well with you know, main things uh, that, that we use often, but that's not to say that it's gonna play well with every single plugin. The issues is a good place to look to see what's going on. The only thing that I'm aware of right now is uh, a change was recently made in the offline plugin and there was some interop problems. That seems to be offline plugin related. There's an open issue about that. Um, and the previous version, Webpack Dev Server just released a new version about a week ago and the previous version was broken for some reason working with hard source, but the current version of Webpack Dev Server works appropriately. And it's just kind of hard to track these things down. So definitely if you notice this not working with a plugin that you have on your project, please open an issue uh, and let us know. The only other thing that you should really be aware of when using hard source is using loaders um, or using dependencies that when they're bundled uh, aren't done in a deterministic way. So in other words, if you have some loader that changes files and it's not always going to output the exact same bundled version of that file. It's going to change that every single time it runs through, even if the file doesn't change. Hard source isn't going to be able to cache that. So that's something to be aware of. The, the majority of loaders are deterministic and then are cacheable, but because the Webpack ecosystem is so large, it's possible that there are things out there that won't work. Uh, but so far, we've done a pretty good job of trying to find those things and then track down what makes them not work. So definitely check out the issues list to see, uh, to, to see if there's anything right now that, that you may be using that don't work. Um, if you run into any problems outside of that, a good place to check is Stack Overflow too. We try to be active on there, answering questions. Let me show you, just before I kind of turn it over to more broad questions, exactly what the uh, adding of hard source looked like in this project. So it really was adding these two dependencies, hard source and then node object hash, which is what we're using right here in the Webpack config to name our config hash so that hard source knows when to bust its cache. And that's it. That, that um, thing you can see here when I first added it, it was with relative paths but you add the hard source plugin and we required it. And that should be all it takes to load this into your project. So I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen now. Let's kind of check back in to see what kind of questions we have coming in. Cool, so Andrew wants to know um, what the difference is between this and Webpack's existing cache option. I don't know, Z, do you want to talk to that a little bit? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so I guess one part is there isn't strictly a difference. Uh, there are parts of hard source where it makes use of what the cache option does. What the cache option does is it basically creates a memory store, which actually keeps 
copies of your built modules. And then when it does a rebuild with Webpack Dev Server or Webpack dash dash watch, it's first like it builds a module, it, it builds a reference for a module, looks inside the cache to see if that module already exists and if possible reuses it. Hard source works similar, similarly in that it creates those references. So there's less work that needs to be done hitting the file system, but also that it uh, pre-fills that cache where possible. Uh, so that provides a lot of performance. And then also the versions that are put in that cache are uh, pre-built. And so it's really like every step of the process and not just that initial file system hit that hard source is trying to optimize for. Um, because the file yep. system hit is, is very real. Um, it takes a long time to resolve your dependency, especially if it's not an absolute path. Um, and it takes a lot of time to get that data, but all the other pieces that go along inside Webpack for building up uh, your bundled assets are what we're trying to optimize for here. And I think there's a push happening to try to get hard source into Webpack core. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, there's definitely a lot of desire for it because it'd be really great for it to be a first party member. Um, now that Webpack 2 is out, uh, that's going to become a much bigger reality, likely in a future Webpack uh, major version change. Because the, the Webpack, uh, the core team is very much planning on having more regular updates. So that'll make it more of an uh, even more capable sense like Webpack uh, hard source uh, was first released in September. And that was still a point in time for Webpack 2's main development. It could have gone in for Webpack 2, but just all the other changes Webpack 2 was making, it wasn't going to be a reality now. Yeah. Uh, but now that's much better. And like based, the main path is like figuring out what in hard source we can generalize so it's uh, more available to the community to interact with in a deeper level. Yeah, and just to say explicitly, um, hard source does work with Webpack 2 um, and Webpack 1. It's just not built in core to either of them yet. Well, I guess it'll never be built into Webpack 1. <laughs> that should no. have failed. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, are there any other kind of questions about how this might work under the hood or, or how you might be able to adopt it on your project? I mean, the, the integration is meant to be pretty simple. Like I said, there's uh, in the readme, it goes over each specific piece of the, um, let's see, here we go, the plugin config options. I mean, we can kind of review those at a high level to talk about what they are. Uh, just again, to remind you, the most minimal thing that you need to provide is a cache directory, a records path. If you're not already using this, if this is set elsewhere in your Webpack config, then um, you don't need to specify it here. And some kind of config hash. So the other option here, you could use like a process environment variable or something to name your folders. The only trouble there is that then, you know, the, you're going to have a bunch of things in there that might not be exactly right. So it's it's recommended that you just hash your Webpack config. And you let the environment variables, uh, the environment hash rather, which is this here, you let the environment hash take care of the other busting logic. Um, and that will also create a new, you know, that will update any existing things in your cache automatically for you without necessarily creating a whole new folder. Yeah, these other ones, this is just a different thing. So instead of of providing this config where we let a hard source take care of watching these things, you can also have a custom environment hash function um, that handles looking at other things that you may have in your project, like a yarn file that don't directly, you know, impact package.json or your node modules directory. It sounded like we might have had another question come through. So how do you think this would interact with the Webpack DLL? Uh, plugin. Z and I were just talking about this this morning, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, do, do you want to talk at a, at a little more detail about how that might work? I know the idea is that you know, with DLL, there's potential for having like a dedicated implementation of hard source. Um, 
so that it could take better advantage of what the DLL plugin is doing. Um, right now, yeah, I mean, do you want to talk about how that, how that works right now? I think you'd probably do a better yeah. job at it. So uh, right now, uh, there was a change made, I think, in December to HardSource to support DLL plugins. Uh, we're not able to take like full advantage of DLL plugins, but hard source plus DLL will still be faster than just DLL. Uh, the change that was needed was if you beforehand depended on a DLL, a, a dependency inside your DLL module, it would have to rebuild that every time. But now it's hard sources be able to be smarter about that and only rebuilds when uh, either, well, specifically your module changes. So like if you depend on a DLL dependency, it's fine, caches, cache works. Uh, DLL is still able to give you a lot of uh, performance as well uh, that you wouldn't get with hard source alone. Uh, in the future, what we want is a plugin interface for hard source, because one of the troubles right now is DLL plugin has some internal knowledge that hard source cannot access so hard source needs to expose an interface that you would have then a DLL plugin and probably a hard source DLL plugin. And the hard source DLL plugin would be given that specific knowledge that DLL plugin has so that it can more deeply integrate and provide even better performance while also being smart and not getting in your way. A couple other questions here. Um, when might I need to provide the environment hash config option? Uh, I think what I would say to that is if you're using yarn, you should look at the function that's provided inside the uh, readme of the current hard source version, um, because by default, it's only going to look at package.json and node modules for changes. The other time you might want to do it is if you are vendoring any dependencies, like actually have a vendored folder with depths that might change that you need cached. Um, specifying that inside you know, so extending this default config, let's see, there we go. Yeah, extending this default config to include, say, a vendor directory. Um, and that way, any of the scripts that you're including in that vendor directory will properly be cached. I should say, if you don't do this, um, the only consequence is that you'll have to wait for those things to be processed by Webpack, right? It's not going to break hard source or anything. Whoa. It's not going to break hard source or anything like that. Uh, another question here is, sounds like the best way to use this is NPM run dev enable cache. I don't see much use for QA or prod. I think the only things I would say there is it depends on how long your, your build time is. Um, you know, if you have, say, a CI run, and that's taking you 20 or 30 seconds to get feedback, um, your CI box could do well to have a cache enabled. Uh, but prod build, it really depends. Um, if you don't mind waiting, then fine. But yeah, the biggest impact that we've seen is definitely on active development. Um, and it does work with Webpack Dev Server. Let's see, does the Webpack build benefit from using this plugin if I'm using Webpack's watch and keep alive configs and touch a file, or is this only beneficial between launches of Webpack? As long as, well, correct me if I'm wrong, Z, but as long as your, um, your current you know, running Webpack process has knowledge of hard source, so your config's been modified to include hard source, it should play well with watch. It should play well with Webpack dev server. So if it detects a change in the file, it should be using your cache for anything that has not changed still. So you shouldn't have any, uh, you shouldn't have any issue using Webpack's watch or keep alive configs along with Webpack hard source. You should still get the benefit. Yeah, I can, I can add that to that a little. Yeah. Um, in part has to do with, uh, other options, there are some things you can get still uh, performance benefits with, say, uh, that, that are less obvious. Uh, hard source uh, supports source maps. If you're using, say, like uh, eval source maps for your dev environment so that each module uh, internally stores the source map instead of uh, a larger source map, which is like the normal recommendation for development use, hard source provides a benefit there because how the by its name, like it's literally keeping kind of like a hardened version uh, in its cache. It also includes a hardened version of the source map. So when it's rebuilding, it doesn't need to, Webpack doesn't need to go and rebuild as much source map work. 
Um, there's also other small benefits in that same way that the cached versions are not as flexible as the normal Webpack versions and hard storage just uh, immediately drops its cached version if it needs to do, uh, if, hard, if Webpack needs to do more work with it. There's a couple other questions here. I want to, I'm going to share my screen again, just to show that minimal config. The other thing I'm going to do is put a link in chat that uh, shows you on GitHub. That duck hunt game is an open source project of mine. So you can always reference that. So there's a link to that. Now to just share my screen again. <clears throat> Yeah, the minimal config, uh, you have to instantiate the hard source plugin and you have to give it a cache directory. So a place to put its cache data. If it's not already specified elsewhere, you have to give it a records path. And this is what tells Webpack um, how to persist the IDs that it assigns to your various modules when it's running a build. And you have to give it some kind of mechanism for hashing your config to know, you know when to bust the cache and what to name those folders that it's going to use. And the recommended way to do that is this way by using a node object hash. This is just something that hashes a JavaScript object and passing it your Webpack config. This callback um, is expecting to be passed the Webpack config. So this here is the minimal config uh, available. The uh, documentation in Webpack hard source provides sort of multiple things that are, you know, available. So like this says, this is optional. Um, it is, but you probably want to use it. Otherwise you only have a single cache and things could get kind of screwed up for you. So definitely, um, even though it's optional, we suggest that you provide config cache all the time. Environment hash, just to review one more time, since I think it's relevant to this question, you really only need to provide if you're doing something like vendoring dependencies, that are you know not inside node modules or you're using yarn or something else where you would want to trigger your build based on a change to a file that is not in node modules not in your vendor directory if you're using it and not in package.json so something that's totally outside of your project um, and again if you fail to provide this and you are using vendor dependencies or you do add a node module you're just not going to get the benefit of of caching that stuff it's just, it shouldn't break anything. Can invalidated cache directories be detected and removed all child directories that do not match? Um, so theoretically, yes. Uh, <laughs> there's an issue that's trying to explore the best way to express that in a config parameter, which is really the challenge right now. So that is something that's manual. Um, you are kind of responsible for purging your own cache uh, if you're not changing your config a lot, you probably won't have a bunch of different cache directories, but it's something to keep in mind. And as I said, I do think that we'll solve that. It's not a problem that's like, oh my God, how do we purge the cache? It's just something we haven't had a chance to do yet. I want to add something to that. Yeah, please do. Uh, the main reason config hash exists as, so, so config hash is an option. You don't need to use config hash if you only are going to have one, only one configuration uh, with Webpack and hard source. Uh, you can drop that and you can drop the square bracket config hash from the paths and you'll have one config, uh, one cache directory. And that will be uh, uh, busted every time your environment changes through the environment hash. Config hash exists for Webpack environments that have multiple conf uh, configurations. A lot of projects will have one Webpack config for development and one Webpack config for production, or their configs might be generated. And one of the most common uses, I'd really say, is people using Webpack and Webpack Dev Server. It's not super obvious, but Webpack Dev Server, when given a configuration, actually makes small changes to it. Specifically, it automatically enables the hot replacement plugin. And so if you're using Webpack and Webpack Dev Server with the same configuration, you want to use config hash because it will give you two cache directories for each of those 
or we'll give you one one cash directory for each. Yeah, I think to that point, we, we might be able to answer Jay's other question here, which is how will hard source save time while running Mocha tests each time you make a change on a JS file, which is a major pain. Uh, it is. <laughs> so usually for, for projects that I've been on, we try to run a separate Webpack config for CI or you know any kind of testing scenario. Um, and to that end, we should be able to cache that as a separate cache directory that Webpack config should hash differently. It should have its own cache directory. And again, you should be able to just run those tests and have Webpack know to use your cache files. If you're somehow writing tests that are not operating on your Webpack builds, like if you're somehow excluding Webpack from your test environment, then there's nothing that hard source could really do. I'm not sure exactly how you might be doing that. I guess it kind of depends on the application. Um, there's another question here about, I'm explicitly excluding buffer and crypto from the Webpack bundle with Node. My second build with the hard source plugin seems to fail. Um, any ideas? I think, so this is something that we're happy to help debug. Um, definitely put some more data about that um, up on Stack Overflow and uh, we can take a, a little bit more time to dig into what that could be. Um, I assume it fails to like fail to resolve module or something like that. So. We'll have to dig into that a little bit. In theory, um, it shouldn't be doing that because it should say, oh, I can't resolve the module, no problem. Let me go out to the file system and get it. There's another question here that is, uh, could we talk a little bit more generally about strategies to reduce Webpack build time and size? Um, yeah, I think the, the high level things that I would say is one, we wanna do another screen task um, about sort of bundle analysis using Webpack's profiler to look and find like, okay, you're, you know, requiring some whole dependency. Theoretically, we should be using tree shaking to like toss out unneeded exports. Um, but that doesn't always work the way we want it to. And we still end up with some unnecessary code in our bundles. And uh, Webpack's profiler is a great way to identify that and also identify like, what is causing your bundle to be so large? So like my Webpack, um, you know, bundle for Duck Hunt is something like 2.6 megs, which is pretty big. Uh, and the reason for that is a lot of low dash dependencies that I'm using and the um, rendering engine and some of its associated dependencies. And so by looking at the bundle analysis, you can kind of look at that and go, okay, well, <clears throat> yeah, this, this particular thing that I'm bringing in is doing X, Y, Z for me maybe there's a way I can either live without it or write a first party implementation that involves less um, edge cases. A lot of times the dependencies that we bring in like Lodash have really powerful functions that are made to solve for lots of possible edge cases when you call them. And if you know that you don't have any of those edge cases, you can save a lot of code. Not necessarily the best advice, depending on what you're building, um, because you may run into those edge cases. So there's a, there's a risk there. I don't know if you have any other general advice for, you know, reducing build time and size, but uh, those uh, are I can think of a few things. Um, uh, if you haven't used it yet, there's a, a package called Happy Pack, which is like basically utility to work with Webpack to do loader building in their own node processes. Uh, doesn't work with every loader, uh, requires uh, much more manual configuration. Uh, but if you can set that up, that can be a pretty nice uh, boost to build time. If you have like a four C or four core CPU on your machine, you can build four times the number of loaders that you normally be able to. Um, that also then works well with hard source because then hard source still is able to cache. Uh, hard source's cache effectively caches all the work of all loaders. So you still get that benefit. But then if you also have multiple files changing at the same time, you get multiple loader, uh, multiple modules being built at the same time. Um, you, uh, Christopher also asked the same question at DLL plugin. DLL plugin's really great for providing uh, build time. And if you want to consider it for size, uh, DLLs can be used over a large number of builds so that users only grab like a DLL that can be like a month old because it's still 
uh, still works and it can be hard cached on their browser. Uh, the DLL like lets you build, uh, for anyone who isn't aware, DLL lets you build a bunch of say dependencies. Like if you're using like uh, React, you can get React and React DOM, all of its files into a single DLL. And then all of your future builds needing React and React DOM will use that DLL and it gives a lot of build time performance boost and it gives that uh, caching benefit for the user. Uh, some other size stuff. Size definitely gets uh, pretty tricky. Yeah, I think like what you were saying previously is it's not just size of your bundle, it's like how you're going to chunk it out and deliver it to your users. So it is important to manage size, but I think thinking about using DLLs or async chunks or anything that kind of prevents your user from having to take the entire thing on at once. But again, it depends on your application, whether or not you can actually do that and have your application function because some stuff you really do need everything. Yeah. Uh, if you're not using hard source uh, on size on that caching stuff too, uh, the records path, which you can use outside of hard source uh, is a really great option because it helps make your builds more deterministic so that you can have one build today and then you make a build tomorrow. And if you've made no changes, it will be a identical. Um, Webpack 2 also does some other things that make this more likely to do without records path. But with records path, uh, you get those benefits. You get those benefits with async chunks, and you can just produce more parts of your build that are uh, more cacheable for users. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think um, we're about out of time now. But um, if you have any questions, you know, problems that you run into using this, either open an issue or uh, go to Stack Overflow. We're going to be trying to keep our eyes there for, for general things like, hey, I'm using this on my project. It's not working with XYZ. Um, and of course, pull requests, very welcome. Suggestions on how to make this better. If you have any thoughts on that cache purging problem, we would love to hear them. Uh, yeah, and feel free to reach out at any time if you want to uh, find other ways that we can work together. Thanks, everyone. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining. Um, as Matt mentioned, we're gonna be posting or sending out the recording um, of this webinar and posting it on YouTube. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for coming and we hope you have a great day.